reality where millions of Palestinians are living in uh, hideous conditions, particularly in Gaza, where 1.7 million people are caged in, uh, in conditions that are calculated to destroy, calculated to destroy the foundations of civilized and social and community life. And I saw that myself when I visited Gaza last May. And, you know, it was amazing to talk to students in Gaza who are, are the same age as many of uh, us in this room. And, you know, they have the same horizons and the same ambitions as people of 18, 19, or 20 anywhere in the world, but just feeling a total, total sense of isolation and uh, a, a knowledge that all the hard work they're putting into their education, they'll have nowhere to go. They'll have no way to use it and nowhere to go. Uh, and that's the most uh, crushing experience, I think, for me. Uh, people say, well, the, the physical deprivation is bad. The shortages are bad. The fact that, God, uh, that every household in Gaza gets no more than six to eight hours of electricity per day is terrible. But people say, you know, you find ways to cope with all these things. What you never get used to is the isolation. And that isolation is now deeper than ever with, uh, the, since the coup in Egypt and the tightening of, of the siege on that front. So uh, the other element of Israel's strategy <coughs> has been really what we're seeing, uh, I, I, I guess, uh, Northeastern is, in a sense, the head of the spear, because, as I mentioned, this is the first case of um, an SJP being banned outright in the United States. It's happened previously uh, in Canada, but never to my knowledge in the US. And it wasn't a coincidence. It was the result of a really years-long campaign by off-campus groups, one called uh, with the, I don't know if they intended the irony, but it's called Americans for Peace and Tolerance. It's actually founded by a gentleman called Charles Jacobs, who is a, a very far-right uh, pro-Israel supporter and very explicitly uh, Islamophobic. And he's been campaigning and pressuring the university and so on uh, for a while. He also happens to be the founder of an organization called The David Project, which uh, is a national nonprofit pro-Israel organization that specifically focuses on shaping debate on campus and uh, trying to uh, use a number of tactics to uh, suppress the Palestine solidarity movement. And in a sense, even though I wish the Hampshire College administration were more uh, courageous, about uh, talking openly about divestment here. In a sense, you can understand their predicament, because uh, when you look at what uh, other colleges and universities have been subjected to in terms of outside pressure and vilification for far less, you can almost understand them saying, you know, we just want to lie low. Um, the the David Project did some very interesting thinking about the problem Israel has in the United States and the long term, and their assessment is that in the long that, that in the rest of the world, Israel is already seen so negatively that there's no hope really of turning that around. Uh, and that in Europe, the, the struggle is really to prevent Israel from being seen as an international pariah as apartheid South Africa was in its final years. And so that they really see the United States as where the core of the battle is. And um, they lay out this analysis in a white paper in 2012, which criticizes earlier approaches to uh, suppressing Palestine solidarity activism and academic inquiry related to Israel on campus. And they lay out a new framework. And this is very much in line with the Reut Institute's recommendations. The old approach involved confronting and debating. 
The new strategy emphasizes making friends and influencing people. Uh, and surprisingly, but I think crucially, the paper demolishes the notion long promoted by pro-Israel groups that American college campuses are rife with anti-Semitism. Uh, they say, quote, most American college campuses are not hostile environments for most Jewish students. Racial anti-Semitism of the kind most associated with the Nazis is not likely a serious problem on any American college campus. Claiming otherwise does not jive with the lived experience of many Jewish students who know they can identify as Jews and largely not suffer repercussions. Consequently, depicting campus as hostile to Jews has not to date proven to be an effective strategy for decreasing anti-Israelism. For anyone committed to the struggle against racism in any form, the lack of anti-Semitism on campus can only be good news. But for Zionist organizations, it makes the campus environment a more challenging, <coughs> though no less central, battleground. And to solve the problem posed by the absence of anti-Semitism, the David Project has promoted a new term, anti-Israelism, <coughs> which it describes, quote, as a specific form of bigotry targeted against the modern state of Israel. This redefinition, as we shall see, or as I will, as I argue in the book, we, I will talk briefly about it, is a crucial element in the effort to restrict campus discussions of Israel's racist practices or its claim to have a right to exist as a Jewish state. So, What I argue is happening is that uh, there is really an effort to either expand the, I mean, the way I understand anti-Semitism is anti-Jewish racism. And as with all forms of racism, we have to commit ourselves to actively and positively combat it and exclude it from our communities. What is uh, underway is an effort to either define this new kind of bigotry, anti-Israelism, or to expand the definition of anti-Semitism in a really uh, worrying way. And we saw this in a resolution that was introduced in the Illinois Senate uh, just in the past few days. I actually just heard before I came here that it was, uh, it was actually defeated in committee, which is great news. But this... Uh, this uh, law, this, this resolution, another one in Maryland in particular, actually define criticism of Israel, uh, or, or they, they define anti-Semitism as bigotry uh, or hatred of the state of Israel. So it's, a, again, this effort to, to, uh, to uh, in a sense, to uh, demonize or to, to delegitimize any criticism. And the consequence of this is crucial if it succeeds. Now, in, in my book, I have a chapter called, Does Israel Have a Right to Exist as a Jewish State? And um, this, this question was very crucial to me because, you know, if you follow the news about what's happening in Palestine or with the so-called peace process, you'll often hear uh, Israel or American officials say that, Palestinians must recognize Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state. And uh, in fact, Israel has made this a, a, a condition, a precondition. But you almost never see any kind of uh, uh, analysis of why Palestinians reject this. What does it mean? First of all, what does it mean for Israel to be a Jewish state? What does it mean for Israel to have a right to exist as a Jewish state? And what, what consequences would this have for uh, non-Jewish indigenous Palestinians and others? And so it was critically important for me to take this Israeli demand very seriously and to examine it in detail and to go through the logic. And in, in the book, I do that. And um, basically, I, I argue that if we take the idea of a right a, a, a liberal, uh, the way it's seen in, uh, you know, uh, liberal, legal, and political f philosophy, a right is a claim that is enforceable. Uh, 
if, if you have a right and someone violates that right, you must have a remedy in order to be able to, to, to for that right to actually be real. There's no right without a remedy is the shorthand way that legal scholars put it. And so if Israel has a right to exist as a Jewish state, and by that they mean Israel has a right to maintain a Jewish demographic majority, that's what the Israeli leaders actually mean, then how can that right be violated? If you say that, if, if I say that um, the, the, the men in this room have a right to maintain this room as uh, a room with a male majority, you immediately understand the implications for everyone else who doesn't identify as male. The, the only way that, that that right could be enforced is by excluding uh, women uh, and uh, others who, who don't identify as male. And this is basically in shorthand what it boils down to, but in the book I go through that quite logically and look at the Israeli policies that um, that actually discriminate against Palestinians and others in the name of maintaining a uh, Jewish majority, a so-called right to exist as a Jewish state. And what I argue is that there, there is no such right because uh, the only way to enforce this right is by discriminating against other people in, in ways that are anathema to anybody who, who uh, in the 21st century espouses human equality. But it's really, uh, and, and this is why I think, uh, well, let me say that th in my reading of the definition of anti-Israelism, or the, uh, ex uh, or the expanded definition of anti-Semitism, according to pro-Israel groups. Asking this question and answering it in the way I do is a form of bigotry that should be disallowed. They're very explicit that it should not be tolerated on campus or anywhere else, which is why we're having resolutions introduced in legislatures around the country, even in Congress. And that you should, by me having this discussion uh, and, and bringing these ideas onto your campus, you should be able to go to the appropriate university administrators who um, would uh, intervene in a case of a hate crime or a, a bias-related incident. There's an effort to bring this discussion under the purview of disciplinary proceedings and uh, that are reserved for uh, bias and discrimination. That's the implication of what the David Project is doing. And it doesn't just touch student groups, and it doesn't just result in bans like um, what we've seen with Northeastern SJP, uh, but it, it also targets professors and educators. And the David Project is very explicit that university teachers must be a primary target. They say, in the long term, efforts must be made to limit the ability of faculty members to use their positions to propagandize against the Jewish state. And by propagandize, they mean simply to, to allow open discussion. But while longer term strategies are formulated and take effect, the David Project is shockingly frank about what needs to be done now, and I quote, in the interim, accusing faculty members who propagandize against Israel of academic malpractice is likely to be a much more effective strategy than challenging specific allegations or invoking anti-Jewish bigotry. Uh, rightly or wrongly, the current campus atmosphere is much more sympathetic to charges that teachers are not satisfactorily teaching their subject than to complaints of anti-Jewish bias, and Israel supporters will likely have a greater practical impact by framing their concerns in this manner. So um, 
the, the attack on um, advocacy for Palestinian rights and academic inquiry uh, on campus is something that is uh, a strategic, uh, is part of a strategy that includes, and I won't go into this in detail now, but um, we can, we can uh, talk about it in, in the discussion, but it includes lawfare, legal uh, lawsuits and civil rights complaints targeting individuals and universities that have been used all over the country. So far without success, but as some of the authors of these strategies uh, will say, you know, ultimately, we, you know, they say we'd prefer to win, but even if we lose, we're making life such a hassle for students involved in uh, SJPs or teachers who, you know, uh, dare to stray, that we'll, we'll be deterring people from joining groups and, you know, we'll be deterring teachers basically from <coughs> teaching. And so they see it as a win-win even if, if they lose. Um, I'll, I'll close this section by saying that um, when I was here in 2009, we were just at the beginning of this. Not everything that has been going on is entirely new, but we were at the beginning. Uh, and it was a few months later that the Redwood Institute strategy was launched. And now, four or five years in, uh, millions, perhaps tens of millions of dollars have been spent by pro-Israel organizations to try to extinguish the Palestine Solidarity Movement uh, and particularly the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement. And I think it's, it's not controversial to say that this movement is bigger and better known than ever. And the fact that it's now being loudly denounced by John Kerry and Benjamin Netanyahu, among others, as well as supported by uh, global figures like uh, Stephen Hawking shows that actually um, the effort to suppress it has been like pouring uh, water on a, uh, an oil fire. It's simply uh, spreading. Um, in this book, I just want to say a, a, a something on a couple of other topics and then I'm, I'm eager to uh, have some discussion with you, but it was very important to me in this book to make some connections between the struggle for justice in Palestine and what's happening here in the United States and other parts of the world. And, you know, a, a few days ago, there was a vote in the UN Human Rights Council on a number of resolutions relating to Israel's violations of Palestinian rights. And uh, the vote in, on, in each case was 46 to 1. And the 1 was guess who? <laughs> the United States. The only country to vote against these resolutions. And, you, and, and this isn't new. We've seen this time and again. But, and it often prompts the question from people. They say, well, how can the United States, which supposedly upholds equality and freedom and democracy, take such hypocritical positions uh, when it comes to uh, Israel and Palestine? And it, it has incre increasingly, over the past few years, I came to the realization uh, through the great work that uh, many <coughs> others have done that the United States is not going to care about Palestinians or other people around the world when there are so many millions of Americans who are deprived of the most fundamental rights. And that the United States is a country that will support Palestinian rights only to the extent that it is undergoing a process of decolonization uh, at home. And a very influential book for me, which I, I discuss uh, right at the beginning of, of my book, is Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, uh, on mass incarceration. Because it, it's a really important book. It serves as both a warning. I mean, you could, you could formally dismantle uh, Israeli apartheid, uh, just as the United States formally dismantled 